This is take two, Suzanne Carroll. Morning. There we go. Hello, sister. Hello again. Here we are. We're back. Excellent. I'm happy. I am happy to see you. I cannot even believe that we have not met in person. Mm -hmm. That oh. all of our interactions in working with you with cannabinoid therapeutics has happened um, through telehealth. Yes, it has. And it's all worked. And it's all worked. So this is, this is the hope we want to bring people. The other thing I want to start off with too, is that you are a person that would least likely use cannabis. Would you agree? Never in the world. <laughs> Some days I still can't believe it. Like what it has done for me has just been absolutely amazing. You know, I can't even describe the difference in my life and my family's life since since I've met you or not met you. So let's start from the beginning. All Remember right. we, were, we were talking a little bit about, um, I don't think people even know what you have going on. So when I first met you um, and you, you, know, you had told me that you had gotten your medical card, you had been to the dispensary, you got some edibles, but they sat in your refrigerator, you tried one, it didn't really work. And so you put it aside mm -hmm. and then your nephew, Sean Curley, hello. Sean Curley recommended that you contact us. Yes, he did. So I did. And you have done some amazing things for me. And I know from some neighbors and friends that you've done amazing things for them as well. Aww. So I just can't even describe how grateful I am that my nephew kind of pushed me, took a little bit of a push, I'll admit, but you know, it was the best push ever. He's now my favorite nephew, as he knows, so for, for obvious reasons. That's so wonderful. So the, the, your story as to what led you to cannabis, because when I met you, you were on a ton of pharmaceuticals and they Absolutely. weren't working. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to what brought you to get your medical card, the condition that you had. Yep. Uh, actually, several conditions. I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know if you even know that I had a stroke where I was in a coma for two weeks, and uh, before that, I had been diagnosed with MS, and with it, and I had had some kind of an incident because I was very unsteady. I walked with a walker. I taught school using my walker, which was kind of an interesting challenge, um, and then I had a stroke, and um, while I was in a coma at Mass General. My husband said to the, the doctor that was treating me, what will we do about her MS treatment? Because I have been giving myself an injection of Avonex every single Friday. I get home from school, I try to relax, I give myself my shot, and it made me sick until Sunday. I mean, like sick in bed. And I did that for five and a half years. And they kept saying, well, you know, the, the, the side effects should lessen. They never did. And um, I, I get confused. There's so many things wrong with me. It's hard for me to even to tell you. Well, one of the things that really stuck out to me and what we worked on right away was you have the syndrome called CRIPS, chronic regional pain syndrome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is yes, a I devastating, do. debilitating illness, mm -hmm. which completely, you know, made you disabled and bed bound. You know, mm -hmm. you had told me that out of 24 hours, you were in bed for 20. That's exactly right. You were on multiple pharmaceuticals, including mm -hmm. fentanyl. Very, very high dose of fentanyl. Just so people can know, what was the highest dose you were on? Do you remember? Yes, I do. 200 micrograms. So 200 micrograms of fentanyl for those people that are new and watching. I used to do intensive care nursing and recovery room nursing. And basically 200 mics of fentanyl would be enough to do a surgery on a patient. So just imagine, so that was 200 micrograms a day. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I was still in pain and I obviously couldn't increase my dose. And one of the things that happened is I originally had that in one arm, complex regional pain syndrome. I had it in one arm, but what they think can happen and does ha happen to me, apparently you're, you know, all of your limbs, you know, the cells are in the same area of your brain. And therefore, in some cases, it can act 
it started out in my right arm. And what I had done, I had fallen and I got tripped on the edge of the carpet and I reached up and grabbed the mantle. So my right arm rotated. So I broke my arm, dislocated my shoulder, I shattered my greater tubercle and I shredded my brachial plexus in my right arm. So, okay, that was fine. When I, then I had my stroke. And when I first came out of my stroke, I had no pain in my right arm. But unfortunately, it gradually came back. And then eventually, it actually traveled to all four limbs. So I actually still have it in all four limbs. And I had a neurotransmitter implanted in addition to the fentanyl. And it, when it was one arm, I got quite a bit of relief from it. But when it was trying to deal with four limbs, everything was a little bit different. Did not help as much. And there was, well, you, can, you know the condition. There's nothing, yeah. there's no cure. So for our new viewers, there are people that are listening for the first time. So she had to have surgery to have this internal neurotransmitter signaling system put into her body. And the goal is if you understand when we talk about cannabinoid therapeutics, the endocannabinoid system is the largest neurotransmitter signaling system in our body that regulates all other organ systems. Mm -hmm. So this internal device was supposed to mimic or supposed to help to regulate, right? The other neurotransmitter signaling systems to help her body to not be in so much pain, right? To stimulate those other mm -hmm. systems. Yeah. And it didn't work. Not so it was all the limbs. It was in all four limbs. And I, I've, I've taken care of one other patient um, that has had this um, and, and she's had tremendous results as well. And she's from another state. So your journey with cannabis. So you were suffering, you were in bed. Well, I want to just go back to one quick thing too, because um, we were talking about, I was calling you sister Suzanne and mm -hmm. you're married. So our, yeah. I think, I think people need to know that you, you know, you, you served <laughs> the mm -hmm. church. Yep. And then you, so just, just, just talk about that story because I, I just, it's a love story and then we'll get back to. All right. Well, when I graduated from high school, I ended up going away to college for a year and I, I don't know, I just had some issues. So I went and talked to my parish priest and uh, during the course of the conversation, he brought up being in the convent and sisterhood. So I thought about it a little bit and I thought, not for me. Well, he called my mother, actually, and said, you know what, here's what she needs to go in the convent. Here's what she needs to do. My mother said to me, are you going in the convent? And I said, I don't know. So then I said, well, oh, well, might as well. So I actually was in the convent for five and a half years. I was the sister of St. Joseph. I taught, I taught chemistry at Cathedral High School in Springfield. Let me just take a little drink. Yeah, I'm going to take a drink, too. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers to mm -hmm. Sister Suzanne and all of her accomplishments on her journey to health and wellness with cannabinoid therapeutics and all of the health and wellness tools that nourish our endocannabinoid system. This is to you. Here's. <laughs> here, here. Mm -hmm. um, so you were a nun in the convent. Mm -hmm. You were teaching uh, chemistry. Mm -hmm. You yep. also, you went to Boston College as well. Yes. Well, I went first. I went to the Elms and got my bachelor's. Then I went to Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester and got my master's in natural science. Then I um, ended up, long story, but I ended up at BC in the doctoral program and eventually got my PhD in curriculum and instruction with a major in chemistry and a minor in computers, amazingly enough. So that was my, that was before all this happened. Right. So I was teaching, I taught school for 32 years. I have two child, two grown children. Um, so I, you know, I did all the normal things after I left the convent and I did stay in the convent for five and a half years. And Thank I, you for your uh, service. Yes, yes. Well, sort of. Well, and then decided that it wasn't quite for me, which I okay. should have made that decision before I went in, but that's okay. It, it formed me as a person. Totally. It's part of my life that I am still proud of. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of myself the day that I got my novice's veil and it, with my two grandmothers, and it's, I, it's displayed in the living room. The reason it's displayed is one day when the priest was here for a party, 
uh, we got taught, he was looking at my family photos and I had told someone else that I had been looking for this picture of my two grandmothers and couldn't find it. So I, I had found it, so I brought it out and the priest said to me, why is that not displayed with the rest of your family photos? That form, that's, you as, that's who you are. And I said, you know what? You're, I said, I'd like it better if I get, could get myself taken out of the picture and just have my two grandmothers. And he said, don't ever do that. He said, that picture is you. It deserves to be out with the rest of your family photos. So it's now on the shelf in my living room. And I just love it. So I what I would it. love to do is, um, is get a copy of that picture so we can put it with this video so people can see. Mm -hmm. um, you've had a very, very rich life. You've been through a lot. And you've you know, experienced trauma. And mm -hmm. what we call that is, is you've come out on the other side. Yes, I have. And I, new with the fresh, smile. I love it. Life. Absolutely love it. You know, now I can go out in my garden. I can work outside. My husband and I can go out to dinner again. I can go to family. Yeah, you have, I have a very large Irish Catholic family. I have six sisters and three brothers. So you can imagine how many family events there are. I missed, I mean, for, for the years that I had this, which, I mean, I have been suffering for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. Oh, and, my God, um, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's a long well, that's time. when I first was diagnosed with MS. And, um, you know, I was in a lot of pain, which is why I started on fentanyl. So that's how long I've been on fentanyl with a gradually increasing dose. So you Up can imagine. 200 micrograms of fentanyl, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. So we started, you started on your cannabis journey. So, you know, mm -hmm. you, you had a consultation with the Green Nurse Group. We started educating you and introducing education on different products and combinations and how to make it work. And your life started to improve because you came on our show a few months later. Mm -hmm. And I remember that it was, we didn't have the video interview, but what you said on that show has changed the perception of so many different people. And truly what is a miracle? A miracle is a change of perception. And so you're sharing your story is going to help so many different people because it helped my mother to decrease the stigma. My mother's completely strict Irish Catholic. She wrote me out of her will. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I can literally. I, yeah. Get it. And she heard your story and she called me up and she said, Sherry, what's the gateway? <laughs> so we started her on topicals and we just started the progress and it took about mm -hmm. six months to get her fully on cannabis, but it's improved the quality of her life. And now I'm back in the well. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm happy that I got you back in. Yes, I'm back in. I'm in like Flynn. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yes. But, you know, my family still can't believe, the, well, my doctors can't believe it. You know, they just cannot believe that I actually, you know, with all the things, and I, I haven't even mentioned you know, the osteoporosis, you know, all the other things that I have. And, you know, the, the, one of the most important things to me is you not only told me what to take and how to take it, but why. And go. as a chemistry person, I absolutely needed to know that. Physiology, so I, the physiology behind, you know, how the plant works in the body, the different methods of administration, you know, how it works on all different systems at the same time and how you can take it different ways to make it work better and other things that you can do in your life to actually make the cannabis work better, which I think is so fascinating. So let's talk about when you like your progression, because now you're off of all fentanyl. As of, you told me, I think it was January 1st, no fentanyl. Mm -hmm. yes, it was. yes, it was. Yes, I made up my mind. And you know, my doctor had said to me, whenever you feel you're ready. So I decided new year, here I go. I'm going to do this. I'm all in. So I, I, but I, it did take me 18 months to get off fentanyl. And, and we I, did it and you did it slowly. So let's talk about how you did that because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are on a lot of narcotics and that are very afraid to come off. I was on over 15 pharmaceuticals at one point. It took me two years to get off of all of them. Mm -hmm. And it was a process and, and, and people are afraid and which I don't blame them because I'll tell you the fear around coming off of pharmaceuticals is this. The fear is that you're gonna feel worse. Absolutely. Right? And so yes. I'm here yes. to tell you that mm -hmm. cannabis bridges the gap from what you're not getting from traditional medicine and will allow you with the guidance of your physician to come off of pharmaceuticals if you so choose, right? Mm -hmm. So we always, when we're working with patients, it's not about me, it's about you. What do mm -hmm. you want? 
And that's how we work with patients. So I was so thrilled when you told me, you know, one day you go, Sherry, I'm going to start working on coming off of those things. And let's I just, it was so exciting for me. As I said, it has changed my life. And I kept thinking my fear was that as I decreased my fentanyl, I would have to, you know, continually increase my medical marijuana, which did not happen, as you know. So that's important for people to hear. I'm going to repeat mm -hmm. it. So like I said, everyone's different. Everyone has different endocannabinoid systems, but um, Suzanne was actually doing all the recommendations, not just the cannabis, but all of the other activities that was helping to increase her endocannabinoid tone. So when she made the dose adjustment of decreasing her pharmaceutical intake, she didn't need to increase her cannabis use because her system was already upregulated, right? So, and I, I just find that so fascinating. Mm -hmm. So for, dad, also for people that are coming off of pharmaceuticals, because this is very fresh for you, what did it feel like? Because I know some days it could have been hard. There, there were days that I thought, oh, I don't think I can do this, you know, that maybe I'll just use a little bit more or maybe I'll just slow it down a little bit. But I followed my doctor's recommendation and he went down percentage wise. So I went, you know, I went from like 100 to one, I had what I wore, I wore 200 microgram patches. So we gradually decreased. So we had 150. And then we went to, you know, 125. So we went down very, very gradually, which is why it took me 18 months. But in the end, it all worked out. It so worked out. It's so mm -hmm. amazing. Which is an understatement. So let's compare really quickly for our viewers what your life was before you started cannabis and what it is today. I think I've told you that every single day I fought to stay up at least till noontime. I get up in the morning, I go to, I go to morning mass. I, I set up for more, I set up for the mass. I, I'm the altar server. Sometimes I'm also the lector. I do whatever I have to do. I do that, we say the rosary. Then I came home and I would do every bit of my housework in the morning because I knew that by noontime, I was not gonna be able to do it anymore. So I went to back to bed. I'd get up around dinner time and uh, after my husband got dinner, I'd get up and you know, I'd go right back to bed as soon as I could. I could not wait to get back in the horizontal position. It was just absolutely unbearable. I did not have the strength to hold my body upright and uh, you know now, now I go out. I work in my yard. I've got. What a is your day like now? So, so your day like before was you just did a church. You did a few things in the morning, and then you were in bed from noon until the next morning. Mm -hmm. so now, what does your day look like? Totally different. Well, as I said, I'm still up. Look at me. <laughs> I know. It's one and you know, other people, that's not really maybe all that exciting. But it is for me because in the past I would have been unable to do anything past noontime, which is at, I know it's hard to believe. And you know, people would think, oh, you just need a nap. That's not what it was. No. I did not need a nap. I just couldn't hold my body upright any longer. The pain was unbearable. Anything I went to, it was like try to be sociable. I'm gonna just it's okay. And I'm just going to pipe in because I know exactly what you went through because the, before cannabis came into my life, I was bed bound, literally mm -hmm. sick and suffering in chronic pain. You know, the, the whole, the, the depression, the anxiety, the agoraphobia, the panic, it was, yeah. just, it was just too much. Yeah. And people, you know, the same thing is that the pain glaring, pain serves no biological protective functioning in our body whatsoever. So the bottom line was that, you know, you had, you know, so you were, your, your quality of your life was horrible before you started cannabis. Absolutely. And then when you started it, it started to gradually improve. You were bridging mm -hmm. the gap from what you weren't yeah. getting from traditional medicine. You started to come off the fentanyl. You didn't have to increase your doses, mm -mm. right? And slowly oh, but surely the yeah. quality of your yeah. life improved. So now when you get up in the morning, you go, you still do your regular morning routine. Mm -hmm. Except for that, you don't go back to bed at noon. And you know, it's very hard mornings. I have a hard time like slowing down because in my mind, I've still got to get everything done in the morning. So I find it very difficult to pace myself. I say, okay, you know, now I have to force myself like it's okay. I could sit down and read the newspaper if I wanted. 
because really I don't have to go back to bed. You know, I don't have to do all my laundry in the morning. You know, it's okay if I don't have it done, but it's very, very difficult for me still to convince myself that I have that the leeway, you know, that I can read a book, I can sit down and knit, I sew. For example, this morning, I worked on making face masks. Oh, for the COVID-19. Absolutely. I have made dozens and dozens and dozens. And in the past, the, the woman who asked me to do it would never have asked me. She's somebody that I know from church who had a connection with, with UMass Memorial and they needed masks desperately. And so she called and she said, could you? And I could, of course. So I have made dozens and dozens and dozens of face masks. And you see, in the past, I would not have been able to do that because I only had room for what absolutely had to be done. Right. You know, so I didn't have the afternoon. Yep. So when, when people are in chronic pain like that, it's about preservation of energy, <laughs> really. Yep. You know, we call it the spoon theory. You know, you have nine spoons or everyone has only a certain amount of spoons and each spoon accommodates an activity. And when you've given out all those spoons, you're done. And, you know, it's not like you can save them and say, well, you know, like tomorrow I really want to do this. You can't. It's not, you can't. it's not like you can save it in the bank. You know, once the day is over, you know, you can't save up. You know, and that's what people have a hard time understanding. It's like, well, you know, lie down in the morning and we'll do this in the afternoon. That's not how it works. No. Your body makes the decision for you. And it's almost impossible to be sociable when you're in pain. It is. I totally remember my experience is that I didn't want to be around anyone. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed. I was depressed. I felt like I was a burden. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, I felt like, I'm going to tell you, a big lump of nothing. That's how I felt. Oh, I do. You don't have to convince me. You know, I used to have to try to say to my husband, you know, like, you go to the wedding. It's okay. And then he, he would either not go or, you know, go by himself and feel like, you know, I'm only half there. So mm -hmm. it was, it was painful knowing what my condition did to my family. As and that's matter, the part that's really important is that when, when people are watching this, you need to understand like with chronic debilitating illnesses and chronic pain, little things like being able to go to the grocery store, go pick up your own prescription, go watch your child's baseball game, mm -hmm. go to a family party, go out to dinner, doing things that normal people take for granted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. You just can't do any of those things. And these are big things for us. Big, huge, giant things because we never thought we would be able to do them again. Oh, absolutely. You know, survival before was, you know, minimum. Any, any little bit that I, you know, every once in a while, somebody would have like something in the morning. And my problem is my family, I don't live close to my family. So therefore, you know, by the time I got, they live in Western Mass, most of them. By the time I got to the function, I was too tired to even go. Used to be like, where can she have a, where can she lie down for a while? You know, how can you get out? So it was not worth going. No, you I, know, I hear you. Know, you. To take the energy, I didn't have enough energy to want to go. Yeah. Sometimes I would force myself, but it was never really enjoyable. Well, you so, just think of too about the energy exertion that it even takes to get ready. Not worth it. People take that for granted. Mm -mm. Taking a shower, washing your hair, like all of that stuff takes a ton of energy that you don't have when you're in chronic pain. You don't, you don't have it. You know, my no. mother said it, my mother said it most um, beautifully because I had her on my show. She came out of the cannabis closet when she wrote me back into the will and she started having like amazing results. And when she came onto the show, her number one statement was this, I cannot believe how good cannabis makes me feel and I'm not high. That's, that's what people have to understand. There, I never have had a single bit of feeling and no one has ever thought, oh, look at her. You know, it doesn't happen. It gives you back your, a normal life, which you yeah. thought you were never, ever going to have again. So, I, have to tell, I have to tell you that I lecture all the time at mass. I've had people that I don't know come up and say to me, what's the, what, what happened to you? You stand upright, you know, your voice is different. You know, just, just watching your face, it's like you're a different person. I tell everybody, because really all I can think of is if this has helped me, if what, I, what has happened to me can help one other person, then I'm happy sharing. I tell your, share, your share has relieved the suffering of my mother. 
you know, so it allowed her to really change her perception around this plan, to have an understanding. And her comment to me about feeling good and not being high was so profound. And the reason why it was so profound is because we're stuck on language, right? The language of what does it mean to be high? So I said, mom, if you're not high and you feel good, what does it mean to feel good and not be high? And so she described it perfectly. She says, the pain isn't glaring in my face. It's background noise. I'm mm -hmm. sleeping better. I have less anxiety. I'm less depressed about my problems. Mm -hmm. and every now and then, I, have a, I can have a little bit more energy to do the things that I wasn't able to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I said, so cannabis is helping you to live your best life correct? And she goes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm in agreement. Totally. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, the endocannabinoid system, you know, one of the things that we educate on is every single thing that we tell our patients to do as medical providers either supports that system or doesn't support that system. So the education around cannabinoid therapeutics not only resides in the plant itself, but also resides in all of the other health and wellness activities that you can do to upregulate that system mm -hmm. that's gonna make the plant that you take work better. Yep. It's, it's just tough. too bad that it's got such a you know bad reputation. I that's know. not the plant's fault. It's that's our the, fault. It's our fault, exactly. Yeah. No, God made sense. the plant, he intended it to be used appropriately. And through you, I am using it appropriately. And I thank God every day that this has happened to me. I can't even tell you. Oh, so I, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so for people that are new in exploring cannabis for the first time, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? To trust you. Oh, that would be number one, because really, you know, for, by my, I am not a dumb person. I could never have learned what I have learned from you. You know, it would have taken me forever. I never ever would have come to the point where I would say, okay, this is how I'm going to take this. I had no idea. So my gummies were sat there forever. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And so the part that's cool too, is that that's why I developed the green nurse group because it took me, you ready? Two years to figure out how to make cannabis work for me below the threshold. So I wasn't impaired or high as they call it. <laughs> Yeah. And CBD was the huge, huge game changer. So I founded the green nurse group upon the premise that, you know, being a disabled nurse, not being able to work in the institutions anymore that I used to do is that if I can help someone relieve suffering and improve their quality of life through educating on cannabis, and if I can get them comfortable in less than two years, then I've done a good job. <laughs> you have done an excellent job. And you know how many people I tell everybody I meet, anybody who, who will listen, I tell my neighbors, well, remember the day that I called you and you didn't answer? You called me back like 10 minutes later and you said I was talking to your neighbor. You remember that? I do remember and he's doing really well. Oh, he just, he just, he, and, and he's grateful because he's, he is a veteran. And I talk uh, to them monthly. I talk to both the wife and I talk to both of them and they're very, very happy. Um, mm -hmm. He's having tremendous results. Yes, he is. And it's yeah. See him out on his tractor in the yard. Oh, you know, oh out God. mowing his lawn. Oh, he's, you know, blowing the leaves. I just saw him this morning. He was out. That's so wonderful. Yeah, That's so wonderful. Yeah. So I want to put. I want to kind of end with a little spiritual, religious type of spin on things. You know about cannabis, mm -hmm. and you know because a lot of you know you a lot of people are worried and nervous that it's a sin. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, I so, oh, I, yeah. so what would you say to them and say, sister, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a strict Irish Catholic. What, what would Jesus say about me using this cannabis? Jesus would say, you know what? I made this plant to be used and use it appropriately. I made it for you. And I say, thank God every day. Yes, me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. So Suzanne, is there anything else you would like our viewers to know? I would like them to know that going through, I have never ever tried to get in touch with you and not gotten you. You have helped me so much. And the other thing is, I think it's important is that, and you mentioned this a long time ago, that it's important that you, you, you get your supply consistently in the same way. 
so that you have the same provider and you know that every single time what you take is the same thing as what you took the last time. Yeah. So really, you know, to go through you, it's, it, to me, it's a no, like, why, why wouldn't you? Oh, so cute. <laughs> and you, you know what bothers me? That because insurance does not compensate in any way, it, it just isn't fair that some people can afford to do this and some can't. And you have made this manageable for me, and I thank you every single day for it. Oh, you're welcome. And we, and also too, with the Green Nurse Group, we are a nonprofit whole health consulting mm -hmm. agency. We do do sliding scale for veterans. We do do sliding scale for people that have financial hardship. And so we generally don't turn anyone away. We don't, you know. Right. And so I tell everybody about you. Yeah. So thank you. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, your story. I'm, I'm going to hold you to a visit. I am coming for a visit. Green nurse on the go. We're going to. That's the price you're going to pay for this. You have to come and visit me. I come promise. Hours, see my garden, have some strawberries. Oh, I'd love to. It would be wonderful. And we can pray together. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm going to hold you to it. Okay. That sounds wonderful. So right. thank you so much for joining us. Your story is going to help so many people. I am forever grateful that you've opened up your heart in your life and to share it with others. Um, and I'm gonna end the show like I always end, is remember everybody what it's all about truly. It's about living your best life. Excellent. I'll talk to you soon. Let me just turn this off, hold on. All right, yeah.